the cloud. Hello, I'm Matthew Kahn. I'm a professor of economics at the University of Southern California. And I am delighted that I'm gonna have the opportunity to be interviewed by a star student at USC, uh, Cole Jones. And uh, the reason I wanna be interviewed, even though the Lakers are playing at this very moment, is I'm about to publish my book, Going Remote, How the Flexible Work Economy Can Improve Our Lives at Our Cities. And uh, I've written books before that nobody read. And so I'm really eager with this new book to start a discussion about this topic. And I thought the right way to proceed would be to bring in a star USC student, Cole Jones, and to ask him to read the book. He, he hasn't told me whether he likes the book and he's been kind enough. He's a great young man to be willing to interview me. So Cole, with that drum roll, please introduce yourself. Well, that was a uh, very generous introduction. Hopefully it's not premature to call me a star student, but um, I am an undergraduate junior student economics and data science at the University of Southern California, um, a minor in accounting. And um, you know, I recently started working as a research assistant with you um, this semester and had a great time so far. And reading this book was a lot of fun. Um, and you know, my, my dad who works in commercial real estate, I was really interested in uh, hearing more about your thoughts on this topic about how uh, going remote will, will shape uh, at least commercial real estate. So you have at least two readers from us. That's very good. I offered my son a copy and he didn't want it. So at a price of zero, that was too high of a price. <laughs> Cole, please, please drive the bus and ask me anything. Right. Um, so, I mean, I just, I, I would like to start out um, asking you, you know, what, what, and in, in the you know Cliff Notes version, what is going remote about, um, and what inspired you to write this book? So the COVID crisis hits in March 2020, and my son comes home from the University of Chicago, and I'm guessing that you went home from USC when you were a first year student, and my wife and I are middle aged college professors. And we had a relatively easier time despite the crisis and because of our privileged positions, we had the opportunity to work from home. My son was kind of miserable working from home and I'm gonna ask you about your experience in a moment. Young people with the, want the full experience of face-to-face -face interaction, both to meet people and to learn. But myself as a middle-aged guy, my parents in their early eighties were actually very happy to work from home home, that it protected them from the virus. They are a lawyer and a doctor, and they were able to work from home. And so Cole, notice these three different generations, the young, and I'm looking at you, the middle-aged, I'm looking at me, and my parents, the old. I, in 2020, started to write this book of how different generations, all privileged with college educations and thus eligible to work from home, how different generations would embrace work from home. And Cole, my book is not set in the COVID time period. It's set in the future. I hope it doesn't read like science fiction, but it's really about a post-COVID economy where a silver lining of the COVID crisis was this experience good effect. So Cole, the question for you. So I talk about Star Wars and I have a feeling you were born after 1977. Have you, has there ever been an experience good that something you, something you tried and it turned out you liked it more than you would have guessed? Um, I mean, one, I, I suppose one experience good that came out of COVID for me was, um, you know, this might not be revelatory to many people, but uh, I turned out, I really enjoyed cooking my own food. Um, which before COVID-19 was not something, you know, I, I would, I would pretend like I didn't know how to make things. So my mom could make them for me. Um, but now that COVID-19 hit and I'm spending more time in my apartment and, uh, you know, I wasn't able to go out as much. I learned that I really enjoyed cooking and, you know, the fruits of my own labor. Um, so for me, that was an experience good. So um, let, let's spend a minute there because uh, you're an economics major. And when we present microeconomic concepts to young people, we assume that people know their conception of the good life, that they understand their utility function. So did I hear you loud and clear that you learned about yourself because you, you were forced to and, and you learned things about your talents and interests that you wouldn't have known, you perhaps wouldn't have known if, if we hadn't had this terrible experience? I mean, yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, that's 
I mean, that's what you define as an experience good is something that you don't know the value of until you experience it, which for me uh, was cooking myself. Um, but I do want to uh, ask you a little bit about the term, the good life, which you use throughout the book. Um, you, you talk about how everyone has their conception of the good life. Um, and as I was reading it, I was wondering if this was a specific reference. Um, is there someone who's theorized about the good life? Um, or just can you briefly explain to me what this means to different people? So I got a C in a philosophy class. And so I, I think in the back of my mind, I've always aspired to be a better philosopher. And so one of these ancient Greeks, I'm not going to pin it on Plato or Socrates, one of them must have written about the good life. And Cole, what I meant by that is there's this caricature of economists that we think that people only care about money, 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 money. In fact, many of us have more sophisticated desires in this life. We seek to be comfortable. We seek to be healthy. We seek to raise happy children. And different, among us, we might have different ways of achieving those goals. A vegetarian might have a different vision of the good life than somebody who wants to be very physically fit or who deeply cares about the environment. So in economics, we believe in consumer sovereignty that each of us has, I'm going to say it, a conception of the good life. Some of us who want to be a professional athlete versus those of us who want to be comfortable and have balance in our lives. What I want my readers, if there are any of them thinking about, is that work from home going forward opens up the possibility of different permutations in our life. An example, Cole, if you love to ski, but you were, are going to be an investment banker. You would have led, led this funky life where you might have been in New York City in some high pressure setting doing the investment banking job while trying during rare vacations to get away to some place where you could ski. In a work from home economy, there might be better balance of having this intense job. But if you're actually able to work from anywhere, being able to do your job will be slightly closer to a mountain top to mix more into your life, this passion for leisure. And that place would attract more people like you. And so you might even enjoy your leisure more because of these synergies of where you are and engaging in this passion of yours. And I believe in your book, you, you sort of summarize this ability as the unbundling of uh, work and where one lives, right? And so that, that possibility that work from home provides um, will create all sorts of new opportunities for workers. Um, but something I already alluded to that I want to get more into here um, is, of course, not every worker is eligible for work from home. But beyond that, um, even workers, a lot of workers who are eligible from work from home may choose um, not to or prefer working in person. Um, so can you talk a little bit about how, how you expect the folks who want to work at the office versus at home, how the demographics of those two groups will be different? So I celebrate our diversity. My son is likely to enter the business world when he graduates from university, and he very much wants to work face to face. I expect that there will be mentors among middle-aged people who greatly value mentoring young people. Cole, oh, there are days when I'm delighted to mentor young people. I expect that America's best firms are going to figure out how to balance the perk of working from home for middle-aged workers with rewarding those who step up and mentor young people. So to partially answer your question, and I want you to follow up, I argue in the book that before 2020, it, it, it was our norm that you go to the office every day of the week. But it, as a college professor, there can be days where I go to the office and I could be just as productive at home. So there's quality of face-to-face -face interaction and there's quantity of face-to-face -face interaction. For-profit firms are gonna figure out how, using their big data, they're gonna figure out how to configure their organization to have the best of both worlds, such that young people, it would be terrible if young people went to the office and couldn't find the middle management and ended up Zooming with them. 
that would be sort of ridiculous. I think firms are going to figure out how to have face-to-face -face Friday to get everybody in and how you build up teams will be crucial that for-profit companies will have very strong incentives to figure this out and to run their own A-B testing around this. And I, and let me see if you agree on this, but do you feel that um, in a work from home oriented company um, that just the way that work divided will have to be separated into smaller tasks that can kind of easily be handed out to individual workers? And is, is there any sort of fear that this will make any individual worker less valuable um, because they're more substitutable? So that's very interesting. It's, I actually don't know the answer to your question. I think that for those firms where, which feature work teams, these teams are going to have to figure out how to coordinate together. They could work from anywhere, from a rework space. There's a question, why do they have to do the work within the physical boundaries of the firm? Cole, in the past, when there was not Amazon cloud computing, you might have to go to the office to access confidential files. Uh, th th there might have been sensitive information. I have on the brain that a team could meet at a Starbucks, which they all want to go to, or meet at a restaurant close to the beach. I think there's going to be, if, if they're in the beach periphery, uh, I think there's many different ways to configure a work team. So in my vision, and Cole, you should know that I've never had a real world job. I was rejected by McKinsey for a real world job that they had a sense. And so I've always been in the academy, but I can imagine for-profit firms decentralizing problem solving to mid-management and these men and women saying to their younger workers, where would you like us to have a group meeting? So face-to-face -face interactions will occur, but why does it have to occur at the mothership? Of, of when do you literally have to go to the mothership? That makes sense. And I'm sorry for skipping around here a little bit, no. but I want to go, I want to go back to the, to the, um, the age topic, because as you alluded, it's likely that younger employees are the ones, you know, scrappy young employees like myself or your son will be the ones that are more likely to want to be in person because they're trying to build their social network, their social capital, but um, older employees like yourself who are already well established in their careers, um, you know, are more likely to want to work from home. Um, so how do you, I mean, how do you stimulate those sorts of interactions where young employees are able to learn from the experience of their, their older counterparts? And then, um, you know, as, 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 along with that, I mean, employees, employees like myself would want to, um, you know, be able to attract the attention of older, uh, older workers. So how do you, how do you create it? How do firms create environments that allow workers to, you know, climb the ladder? So I, so where I agree with you is in this age of big data, th there's a question, how do you impress the boss? And I perhaps naively am arguing in the book that there will be quantitative benchmarks. So Cole, when I work with young co-authors, we sometimes meet face to face and I sometimes give them tests that at which I can verify whether they've done them well by looking at it. And so, so Cole, a question I'd have for you from your past internships is uh, an assumption in my book is in this big data age that, that the boss can verify remotely whether the work is getting done. But during creative stages, the boss may want to meet with the younger people to meet face to face. And I would hope that we live in an economy post COVID where workers can reveal to the boss whether they feel they need more face-to-face -face time. Uh, Cole, as, as someone without a lot of business experience, something that interests me is how much face time is, is workers, is related to productivity versus how much is workers trying to engage in, in nepotism of just trying to be nice to the boss for that reason. And I hope we can agree, even though we're recording, that kind of stuff doesn't really matter. What matters from the firm's perspective is productivity. And if, if bosses can figure out how to mentor young people, both by cell phone and by Zoom and through face-to-face -face and through restaurant meeting, then I'm less concerned that young workers will suffer from the persistence of Zoom. Is that naive on my part? I think I, I generally agree. The, the one area where I would 
And I've heard I've heard this idea of um, virtual water coolers, um, which is an idea where you know even over work from home, you're you're paired up with random people from within your company. You know, not not just within your division or within your team, but across the company. Um, which suggests to me that there might be some value in sort of random interactions between different parts of firms. So I would I would want to hear your opinion. Like, it is is would would a work from home oriented workplace silo their employees too much into specific teams and divisions? Um, that you know a, a headquarter where you could meet up with some random person from another another division at lunch. You know, is is there is there value to be gained there? Oh, I agree with you. And in my book, I hope I don't say that the future is remote work. What, what I want to say is the future is going to be this convexity. We used to always just go to work. And I, I think we're going to see all these different permutations of some people going in two days a week, some people going in five days a week. Cole, if you have a young child of you wanting the flexibility to not go in if there's a doctor's appointment or if she has a dance recital or a hockey game, or if your mother's sick and you need to spend two weeks there. So what I'm in favor of is firms opening up flexibility for workers. And you're right, keeping an eye on whether the mothership is still a productive place. An example, suppose that Suppose you run a firm when you are middle-aged and you have half your workers working remotely. You need half as much commercial space. You might demand higher quality space over quantity and get your workers out of their Dilbert cubes and create a workplace with clean air and good coffee such that you can entice them to come in and such that they're mentally strong and not stressed out when they do come in. So Cole, what, what I try to do at USC, if I only go in three days a week, I try to be great on those days that I go in. So I'm not a cyborg. I'm not a terminator. If USC required that I show up five days a week to campus, I think I'd be a little bit grumpy versus if I at age 56 show up two or three days a week, I try to be on my A game and try to be a great guy on the days I'm around. So Cole, what do you think from the perspective of the mentors, what do you think of that quantity quality trade-off that if these men and women, if these middle-aged workers show up fewer days, but if they're great on the days they show up in terms of being charming and useful, can we agree the young might actually value that versus having a grumpy guy who's always around, but is just standing at the toilet and, and, and looking at his shoes and, and, and mumbling to clouds? I mean, I, I definitely, from my own anecdotal experience with, um, this is the first semester where I haven't had any classes on Fridays. Um, and so even though I'm going to class fewer days per week, I feel like that extra, you know, that extra time off where I get to spend at my apartment, catch up on work, allows me to be more productive the other four days of the week when I do have to show up to class. And so I, I mean, I, I completely agree that, you know, if, if older mentors show up to work fewer days per week, but they're happier when they do show up, um, that even though they might, maybe they're working fewer hours per week, um, but those hours are more productive and more beneficial to the firm. But Cole, where you're correct is if there's a young person, what's true is every firm is going to have to experiment with this. If, if bosses of firms know that they know that they don't know how to get work from home right, they're going to experiment here. Cole, can we agree that firms would observe the following data? Suppose that Jane, um, um, suppose that Jane quickly quits a firm which doesn't have a lot of mentoring on Tuesdays. That do do you agree that the HR office will begin to flag this in their statistical databases and say, "Whoa, students from Princeton! When we attract people from Princeton, they're quitting very often." What's going on here? In this big data age, the HR people are going to see this in their matrix. And can we agree, and I conveniently argue this in the book, that firms will use their big data to look for patterns. So if young workers are frustrated with the firm, these firms are going to see this in a free economic sense and have incentives to do something about this if they want to retain Princeton graduates. I, I certainly agree. And I think a lot of this will you know, I, the, obviously the onus isn't on you to figure this out for firms in your book, but a lot of this stuff is or questions that will remain unanswered until firms have the data, like you've mentioned, and are able to do something with it. Um, so I think we'll see a lot of permutations of what the work from home structure looks like for firms and for workers. 
Um, and that's something, you know, that time will just have to tell. Um, I want to jump to one question that, uh, I mean, you mentioned that both of, both of your parents are elderly, but still working, right? Um, and I think this has happened at the company that my dad works for too, but it seems like there's renewed energy in uh, older people with work from home, especially people reaching their 60s and 70s. Do you, do you see that, be, or will people extend their careers because of work from home? And you know, for, for me, this is concerning if they do, because uh, that you know, lowers my ability to reach the top of the ladder. So I, this is a great question. I want to argue this question optimistically and then um, and then ask me anything. When I was young, I was a labor economist and labor economists made the distinction that you're either in the labor force or you're not in the labor force. So uh, many women uh, exit the labor force during times when if they have young children, um, you're right that the elderly eventually retire. A theme that I talk about in the book is this sort of convexity of uh, just like with an Uber driver, an Uber driver can drive Uber just a few hours a day. If you can be a work from home worker, you can avoid the fixed cost of commuting and you can work on your own terms on either on a platform like Upwork or if you're known by, by a firm, if you're a lawyer, rather than retiring, you could work a few hours a week on your own terms on briefs. And so, Cole, there's two ways to think about this. One way is we have these established workers, uh, young workers in their 30s thinking of starting a family, older workers like my parents in their 70s and 80s. And to some degree, once people have trained and acquired the human capital, it's terrific if they can continue to use this human capital. Cole, I want to say something interesting and controversial. You suggested and I hope you're wrong for your own sake and society's sake of almost a squid game that if my father doesn't retire, that this puts pressure on you. Um, I hope we don't live in that economy, but you might be right. I, a complimentary story would be the following. If an economy keeps more of its women in the workforce because the work from home option is available, and if an economy keeps its elderly in the workforce, are there situations where that accelerates economic growth and increases economic opportunity for young people? So Cole, there's something you don't know about me. I flunked out of macroeconomics at the University of Chicago, but there is a view in macroeconomics, like in the Japanese economy. It's been argued in Japan that if more women participated in the labor force, that this would increase macroeconomic growth and increase economic opportunities for young people. So Cole, I, I'll let you speak in a moment, but um, a hypothesis is that America's economy would be stronger if work from home allows our elderly to work more, allows more women and people caring for young children to participate on a part-time basis. And I also argue in the book that there's many people living in depressed cities like Detroit and Baltimore who are not fully using their human capital. And if they could work for another company located far from where they work, where they live, that this would create new opportunities for them. So, so Cole, you actually asked a very important question of if work from home unlocks the ability of women and older people to work, is this good news or bad news for young workers? And I actually think that that's a brilliant question that maybe you should write your senior thesis on. And I've optimistically argued that it will help you, but I also understand the substitutes hypothesis as well. Um, and you know that you you brought up something that I did want to talk about as well, which is the the social equity conversation involved with work from home. Um, you know, Claudia Golden, a Harvard economist, um, I recently read a piece of, by her where she was arguing that the one way to close the gender wage gap is to sort of increase linearity in pay, um, which you know comes from making workers work more substitutable, um, and when women have more flexibility in choosing when they want to work, that um, this will close the gender wage gap, which seems to be something that, you know, she wasn't talking about work from home when she wrote um, this piece that I read, but it seems it certainly seems like, you know, work from home will be a good test for her hypothesis. Um, but uh, something I, I, I wanted to talk about was 
do you, especially with the race conversation, so let's say you have a lot more black employees working for Microsoft, but living in cities like Detroit or Baltimore, do you, do you worry that this sort of situation where you have maybe both women working from home more often and minority employees working from home more often, that this will create some sort of de facto segregation within companies where you know you have you have your employees that come to the office who tend to look more like me, and you have your employees working online who tend to be more women and minorities, you know, living anywhere in the country. This is a brilliant question. And it's a very and it's a very important question. Cole, let me sketch out an answer, an optimistic answer. As you know, I'm an endless optimist. My mother says to me, Matthew, no magical thinking. Let's think through your brilliant and crucial question. As an economist, I always think by opportunity cost. In 2019, African-Americans were underrepresented in tech, as were women. Tech has been clustered in places like Silicon Valley, Portland, Seattle, Boston. In such cities, there are relatively few African-Americans living in such cities. And Cole, while I can't prove my hypothesis, I believe that one explanation for why Black people are underrepresented in tech is that such individuals don't want to live in those cities. And we can discuss that on another day, but let's take that as given. And so what I argue optimistically in the book is that the rise of work from home, and I'm going to get back to your question in 20 seconds, the rise of work from home, just as you said, creates new possibilities that African-Americans from cities like Cleveland, Detroit, and Baltimore, and there's many of them who are qualified for jobs in tech, can have it all of living in a city where they have their social networks and they're familiar and they're comfortable while working for tech firms. Cole, my King Solomon solution to your point for Avoiding the scenario where such individuals feel like second-class citizens is the following. Amazon is now opening up headquarters like HQ2. So the main headquarters is in Seattle, of course, but Amazon is opening up headquarters in other cities like Alexandria, Virginia. As Amazon opens up HQ2s and HQ3s, I can imagine the following remote work permutations. If Matthew's African-American, I live in Baltimore and I go to the HQ2 for Amazon once a week or three times a month for quality interactions. And so notice what I just did there. Companies like Google and Facebook, if, they're, if they really want to increase their minority sh share of workers working at their companies in real substantive jobs that lead to vice presidential roles, they have incentives to, to open up campuses closer to cities where African Americans and Hispanics want to live. And so I think we're going to see this test of whether these companies are just engaging in rhetoric about diversity, or whether they're serious about building up their pipeline. And Cole, these are for-profit firms with shareholders. I'm a shareholder of some of these companies. If diversity is good for firms' bottom line, they have strong incentives to lean into work from home or work from anywhere to arrange new ways of opening up sub-campuses in cities that raise their propensity to attract great minority applicants who will then want to work for these companies because they can have it all. And Cole, to take it a step further, if I'm a high school student in Baltimore and I anticipate that I can live in Baltimore and work for one of these great companies, if I have the engineering skills and computer science skills, I'm gonna, my parents are going to want me to obtain these skills. And so in terms of growing the pipeline, the rise of work from home creates this possibility of high schools thinking about how to have a more enriched curriculum such that more young people can be eligible for these jobs now that you can live in a Baltimore and work for a great firm. But to come back to your question, you've asked a great question. Nobody wants to be a second class citizen in their organization, whether that's being a professor at USC, working for Amazon, if these companies are serious about growing their pipeline, they will take your question very seriously and they'll speak to these workers of whether they feel that they are second-class citizens. Because if they feel that way, they're gonna quit these companies and these companies are gonna have a retention issue and that's not gonna help them. And I, you brought up an interesting point, which I hadn't really thought about, which is that you know, if, 
if these firms are like Amazon are creating satellite campuses and they choose to put them in places like Baltimore, um, you know, it's, it's an interesting dynamic where instead of uh, employees seeking out the geographic locations of the firms they want to work for, it's kind of flipped on its head where companies will instead choose to place headquarters or location offices um, in the cities where they want workers from, um, which I think is a really exciting dynamic and I hope it plays out. Um, I think the final thing I want to talk about as, um, you know, as we're talking about how uh, the economy will change for work from home workers um, is sort of the elephant in the room, which is all the workers who will never be eligible for work from home, all the non-work from home workers. Uh, can you can you convince me that this that these gains will not only be oriented towards the 35 percent of Americans who are eligible or currently eligible for work from home? Great question. When I was writing my book, my editors who were quite, who are quite brilliant pushed me hard on this point, saying, Matt, we like what you're doing here, but is this an elitist book that celebrates that the one percent are going to have even more fun in this life? And I've thought hard about this question, and here's my answer. And this remains a hypothesis uh, that merits testing and it merits both sociology and economics research going forward. Cole, here's my story. So imagine if Matthew is a high school graduate and I don't have the resume to engage in work from home. I, I've traditionally worked as a bartender. I, I, I could even be a dentist. A dentist can't work from home. Um, I've been a school teacher. There's a question of whether you can be a school teacher from home going forward. Eh? With COVID, it didn't really work. So let Matthew be a worker in an industry occupation who is not work from home eligible. What can I gain from this new geography of work? Let's do a couple of different scenarios. Cole, suppose that work from home workers at Apple now start to move to either Nevada or they move far away from the mothership at Apple. As these successful workers cluster in a geographic place, perhaps near a ski resort, perhaps far out in, in a more affordable community, this will create service sector jobs and teacher jobs and dentistry jobs in a vicinity of where these new residential clusters form. So Cole, from a basic idea from urban economics and international trade is, look, is that services can't be outsourced. Dentists can't be outsourced to China. School teachers can't be outsourced to China. So if Matthew is a ski bum and I am a dentist, if Matthew is a school teacher and I love to ski, if Matthew's a school teacher and I, I'm sorry, if Matthew's a bartender, if there's now new residential communities featuring work from home workers, and if there's enough purchasing power there, I can gain as a non work from home worker in terms of what Enrico Moretti calls the local multiplier effect. And so Cole, what I would gain is if I have funky preferences for skiing, for leisure, if I have a sick mother who lives in rural Missouri, if enough work from home workers cluster there, there can be new opportunities for me to be employed there, even though I'm not a work from home worker. So for someone who knows some astronomy, it's almost like if a star exists, planets and moons will be part of its gravitational force. And so a whole economy can form where housing prices are cheaper relative to being a bartender in downtown San Francisco. And the amenities might be the right fit for what I like to do with my leisure time. Cole, what do you think of that? Is that a convenient argument? And, I, and finally, work, people who are not eligible for work from home, they have children. And if their children acquire the skills for the new work from home eligible economy, their children can be eligible for the economy in the next generation. Cole, how do you grade that? I, I, it's certainly, it's an optimistic take and I, I hope it's the case. What, what concerns me is that we'll start, it, you might, we might see if city leaders in places like Bozeman, Montana and Boise, Idaho, you know, that are seeing a bunch of work from home people move into their cities. I, I see that as being good for the incumbent residents of those cities, but I, I worry that if the city leaders aren't 
put loose enough on zoning laws, don't allow their city to expand appropriately, um, that it could create a situation where prices are high and it's sort of a exurban or rural gentrification issue where you have a lot of highly educated, wealthy people moving into an area and driving up home prices. Um, and if there isn't enough growth to accommodate these new people that you might, you know, the, the teachers that want to live in a place like Bozeman, Montana might not have the ability to move there. I agree with you. I think that we should have a second video where we just focus on that topic of if work from home workers seek to spread out and by the basic laws of supply and demand, if supply is limited in these attractive areas, just as you just said, if demand is increasing for a place where it's difficult to build new housing, prices will soar and incumbent owners will win, but incumbent renters could get priced out of their neighborhood. Cole, I think that's an excellent topic, and I think we should have a short video just on that topic if I could entice you to return with me. But uh, thank you very much for starting with me, and I'm going to stop this recording.